Um, start it again. frame rate looks better it does get his knickers in a twist sometimes I don't quite know why but when it starts up um, if it hasn't been reset in a while it seems to um, I don't know it seems to get it just drops lots of frames but I don't know why but when I re-establish the network, it seems to be okay. I can't work out whether it's the network side of the router or something this side. Uh, I favour the former, I think. Right, I'll just wait for everyone to come back. Apologies. I'm going to enjoy my tea whilst I wait. Uh, that should be better anyhow. Hi uh, Laurie, and the audio is good, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, so I was going to do an update from where we were. I'm just trying to remember where we were. I think when we left, crikey, when was it? Was it Friday? Yeah, it was. Um, I had a problem talking. Is that something in my eye? It's an optical illusion. Um, we had a problem talking to the board over the debug connector. Um, uh, basically, if you look at the uh, JTAG connector or the JTAG standard, Right, let me just see if I can bring it up temporarily. Switch scenes, hold on. Let's see if I can turn the browser on. So on that, what I need to do. Oh here we go. Got it already. Yeah, so if we look at the pinouts in particular, if we look at this, it's these are the standard uh, JTAG pinouts. Um as in designated by arm really rather than um, uh, rather than ST link or ST themselves. Now the important one to look at here is the 10 pin uh, this one here bottom right hand corner I wonder if I can zoom or this one here whichever one you want to look at really so the key thing here is these tend to be um, box headers what do I mean by box headers well, this is a boxed header. Uh, I can't focus on it. It's a very small boxed header. Um, or shrouded rather than unshrouded. And this has uh, plastic around the pins. 
but it also has a polarizer if you look carefully and when I made the last boards I actually got this around the wrong way and the only way I could fix it was by cutting a new polarizer on the other side um, because basically I got the rows mixed up by the rows here I mean it actually looks like columns here because of the way up they are but uh, if you look carefully you've got like ground and stuff on one side and then you've got all the critical pins on the right hand side so those were flipped on the original design now on this design incredibly stupid I managed to flip flip them um, in this case it will be uh, vertically it's incredibly stupid so I've actually flipped them both ways now on two different boards um, and the fix to that is so the way and I foolishly soldered the connector on let me just show you in place what that looks like so this is the the board and if you notice at the top can you see the holes at the top come on focus you can do it There you go. So if we're going close at the top. Can you see here? It's a connector. And the way that um, you would connect that, given the way it's laid out, is you do this, which is exactly what I did. Uh, and I didn't just put it in like that, I actually soldered the damn thing overconfidently thinking oh I'm not going to make the same stupid mistake I made last time well guess what I made a whole new one instead uh, there you go can you see how that's in now the fix for that because the um, columns are flipped in the design all you do is you take it off turn the board over and you put it in on the other side and that automatically flips it but keeps the columns in the right place but uh easy right easy fix unless you solder it in in which case not an easy fix because you have to get the damn thing out <sighs> through holes getting through multi pinned through holes out is tricky at the best of times and with these with a 1.27 pitch so um, even more difficult but anyhow I did eventually do it it's a bit of a mess I don't think you can see it actually what has happened here did I move the camera again really so if you look at the board there um, where's the pointer let's use the ruler so you can see here I'm pointed to with the ruler I've now got the uh, connector on the top and it's a bit uh, of an ugly mod job because getting it out from underneath and then placing it back on the top before the solder um, solidifies uh, sorry yeah solidifies it's pretty tricky but I managed to do it um, uh, I, one of the pins came loose they do because they're in a plastic housing when you heat this up um, it will go through a reflow once okay but if you continually heat them up and if you use something like a heat pencil where you're not really regulating the temperature it's easy to melt the pins and then it, when you put it in it, the pin can just bend up because it's basically in plastic that's slightly soft or molten because of the temperature but it works hurrah thank goodness um, I won't be using these sorts of connectors anyhow the connector I will use on this and I quite like it on this side actually because it's more accessible is these simple ones which aren't shrouded 
Now, can I get it to focus on that? Oh, yes, look at that. So that's a double. But without shroud or housing. <coughs> but it sits nicely on that. Look. And it will stay on. Because what I've done is I've actually offset the pins slightly. So even though this isn't soldered, it will hold it in place. It's kind of a fiction for it, a uh, friction fit, not fr fiction fit. Friction fit, bit of a tongue twister. Um, but it, I do need to maybe increase the friction fit just slightly. Uh, what's the advantage of doing that is, well, this little connector in here, you wouldn't put it in the board like this, you actually insert it in the female end of the IDC cable, and then when you want to debug the board, you just plug the whole thing in, and it just stays in place, without any soldering required. And you can remove it, so you don't have the ugly connector on there when you're not debugging it. Ta-da! Anyhow, so that's what went wrong. Um, I did say at the time, I think, quite possibly, that that was what the error was. And uh, after a lot of testing, I managed to um, establish that that was the case. And I managed to, by holding connectors and wires at weird angles onto it, managed to prove that it would work. Uh, I made an adapter first, that didn't work um, because of the thickness of the pins versus the female connector that I had, among other things. Um, so in the end, as I say, I had to literally move it to the other side to fix it rather than through a cable. But anyhow, that enabled me to run Blinky I know it's a big step from there to it, it meant that I could program it um, with the change code, fix the issues with the code, um, with the pin changes, um, carrying on from where we left off on that to-do list for the Black Crab firmware, the Rust firmware. And uh, that did it. I was then also treated to the... Uh, bonus that I could actually not only load firmware on it, but I could actually, um, after some more adjustments, um, pin adjustments, I could then use what's called the uh, soft SPI, the Bitbang driver with the pins. Um, it does give me another problem, um, which I will talk about, along with some of the other things. So. Um, the board is now working, so we can do some work with it today. So what we'll probably do is get the seven segment stuff working. I can show you Blinky working, things like that, although it's difficult to see here um, because of the position of the LEDs. Uh, if I turn that off, yeah, it might be dark enough. But, let me discuss one of the issues that I have from this that we do need to resolve. So let's just switch back temporarily. So one of the design changes we now have on this version versus the original Proto version, which I made in December, is um, the pins connecting between the STM32F7 and the ICE40 to program it are also the same pins that are used as part of the QSPY. And if you recall, the QSPY is the way that we communicate with the FPGA once we load the synthesis in so that the STM32 can have a conversation and exchange information and data, etc., with the, uh, the synthesized um, logic 
gateware HDL, whatever you want to call it, that's running inside the, um, the i40. Um, because it seems silly to have a four pins not being used after the programming occurs. You want to reuse all the pins where possible. Now the protocol over which the i40 is programmed is basically SPI, only slightly, slightly different. There are some gotchas, which I'm, I'm going to talk about now. So if you look at the code, let me show you, we can go through this. Basically, um, let's get rid of the uh, browser. Let's look at this code. So if we look at the black ice code, um, what happens? That's at probably at too high a level. Let's look at the low level, at the the way that the soft SPI structure and implementation works. Okay. So basically, soft SPI as we have it right now, it, how is that for size? Can you actually read that or do I need to zoom in a bit more, uh, Laurie? Uh, Laurie was asking, do I have a desoldering gun? Um, I have the simple manual one. Um, I tried using this without much success. It's not so good. It's, it's, it's probably okay for um, uh, larger, you know, 0.1 inch headers. It's, it's quite effective. But it, it's quite powerful and it has a bit of a kick. So when you, um, when you do the uh, release, it moves. It's difficult to hold it still and when you're dealing with particularly small close headers pins like 1.27 pitch and doing that it is very difficult to get a good good grasp on it. So not the best thing. It was uh, the only way I could do it successfully in the end was using you know proverbial heat pencil. Um, and heating the entire area and I was a bit worried because the board's upside down I'm heating the back and trying to pull the JTAG sorry the bug connector down but I'm also trying not to dislodge the USB connectors which are hanging upside down or any of the other components in that area which I was really worried about but I did manage it so um, yeah, if we look at this code, the important thing here is you have to go through um, a procedure to program the ICE 40. Uh, I know we haven't talked about this a long time, not not since the uh, MyStorm original MyStorm firmware days, where where we um, solved the initial uh, programming. Um, of the ice 40s uh, only in C and on the Raspberry Pi as well now basically what happens is um, so obviously what we need access to most importantly because it's a spy like it's a serial a shifted one bit serial in we're not interested in what's coming out of the ice 40 because all it's doing is resending what we're sending it so we're not interested in the serial out from the ice 40 we're only interested in three well we're actually interested in, in in five signals but from the spy point of view we're interested in the data in the clock and the select way the chip select those are the three um, serializing spi pins um, but we also need to control the reset pin of the ice 40 which is why we have this here as well so we have sock uh, sorry the clock serial clock master out serial in I know I'm using the old-fashioned um, term um, the serial select pin 
on the IS40 and then the reset pin on the IS40. So the first thing we must do is get the IS40 into what's called a slave mode. Because the IS40 can, if it wants, boot from a flash. So it can read its own imaging as a master from a flash. Now we're not working that way because it's not, not wired in that way. Um, what we're doing is we need to put it in a, a, a serial slave mode because we're going to program it from a, from a master. In this case, the master is the microcontroller, the STM32. And the slave is the IS40. So what we do is, um, first of all, we make sure that the serial select is high, i.e. it's disabled, it's actually an active low signal, just like normal spy selects. We then take reset low, which puts the IS40 into reset. Um, we then take the SS low, select low. Um, we then delay because we need to wait for the capacitance on the reset um, to um, dissipate. Because there's a, in fact, there isn't any capacitance on this one. Um, but sometimes there will be. Um, we then pull the reset high. So we're now taking it out of reset. But when we're taking it out of reset, we've got the serial select low. Now, when it comes out of reset, it goes through its own little uh, state machine. And it checks the serial select pin. If it sees that that's pulled down, when it comes out of reset, uh, hardware reset, that it knows to switch into slave mode. So that's very important. So that sequence there, and then we have to delay. Then we can take the serial select back to high because it should have realized by that. But before we do anything with this, we then wait you know, quite a long delay to allow itself to go through its own internal um, state machine, etc clear some of its registers and that kind of stuff. So that's the first part of when you program or reprogram the ICE-40 and it's the same for the entire family anyhow. Um, the next thing you then do is you effectively go for an SPI type transaction. And remember we're bit banging this here, we're not using an SPI peripheral. So you can see everything that's going on. So what we do here is we uh, basically, we set the um, serial into the ICE-40 as low. Uh, we take the clock high. We take the SS low. In other words, we're starting an SPI transaction or serial transaction. Um, and then we send basically eight clock cycles with delays here. So we're setting the clock up and down eight times. And because we've taken the serial line low, what we're doing is we're just transmitting 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. In other words, eight zeros. We're sending the value 0. Um, now we do that in order to clear through the registers, um, the shift registers that are inside the ICE-40 to make sure they're clear and not full of random stuff that it had on reset. And then we pull the SS high, you know, basically indicating that we've ended that transaction. Um, so this reset sequence is called by something at a higher level. And then what it does is it then um, pulls down the select signal. So it, it calls the select function, which takes the SS signal down. And it starts sending, effectively, each byte of the image, uh, probably from over USB in this case. Okay, and we've got a bit bang send here. Um, very simple. And that just serializes the character, sorry, the unsigned uh, int, 8-bit int. Um, serializes that and clocks it out. Um, but the important thing here is we're not changing the select pin. Okay, 
This is just sending a single byte, serializing a single byte using BitBang. Now, that gets called as many times as there is characters in the image. Um, the FPGA image, the IS-40 image, i.e. the configuration of the IS-40. And all this time, we have it selected with the uh, chip select is low. And then at the end of that, it knows that it's got to the end of data because it counts the byte and then it chooses deselect, which takes it back high. Um, and then what we do is we send a bunch of zeros. I can't remember how many, but quite a few zeros, like, um, I don't know, another eight of them or something like that to clear it through again. Then basically the done signal should change state um, that we should be looking at, although we're not checking it here. We're just assuming it worked. Uh, and then we're ready to rock and roll because then um, we just have a small delay and then meanwhile the ICE-40 then loads that image um, and configures its muxes etc um, and does its uh, field programmable gate array thing. Now, what did I say before? Now. Because we're using the same pins to do the programming here, remember I mentioned these pins before. Right. These are the important ones. Forget the reset for the moment. These are also shared by the QSBI peripheral. Now, QSBI uses these three and another three okay, that we're not using in the programming here. But even though it's a QSPI peripheral, it has what's called a single mode. Now, single mode is just like a normal SPI. So it can serialize down one bit rather than four bits, i.e. the nibble that it prefers to do. However, when you are using the QSPI peripheral in the STM32, certainly with the Rust How, um, and I think also with the STM how in C, uh, the master serial select output is controlled by the peripheral itself. We are not individually setting that high and low in the start of transactions. So when we send a transaction to the peripheral, it deals with, you know, the state of those pins as well as the serialization, etc. And it has a small buffer in there. So, the problem we have here is even though we could send the data, um, every time we send a transaction, it will take the select line low and then back high at the end of the transaction. Now, given that we're receiving chunks of this over USB, we're not going to store the entire image when we are writing to it dynamically over USB, uh, we can't start one transaction and then end it, you know, however many bytes later, um, because we'd have to store it locally in RAM first, the entire image, and that's gonna be big. So we've got a problem, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna have several uh, transactions, which means several selects and deselects. And that's not the way that you should program the ICE-40 it should be under one select, deselect cycle. But not only that, how do you emulate um, what's happening at the start here in the reset sequence? This is easy because you just send zero and a normal transaction. But how do you set the select high and then manipulate the reset, which is what we're doing here, whilst that's in a low state? And I did think, oh, maybe we could send a fake transaction or something like that. But then, because you're offloading it to the peripheral, how do you time the actual reset so it occurs when the select is low? So it's a bit of a problem. A bit confusing. So I was then thinking, well, how do I solve it? I've got another problem as well. 
Say I found a way of doing that by faking a load of dummy cycles. Now, forget what those are for the moment. I, I can explain it later. But if, if I was to send an empty transaction that just had dummy cycles in, that were long enough so that I could time a reset pulse in there, which would be difficult because that, that would be a spawned process. The other problem I have with QSPI is the frequency at which it's running. So by default it runs at 108 megahertz, which is far too fast. Um, I'm not sure even that we'll be able to do QSPI at that speed. Um, maybe later when we've optimized everything, we'll get there. But I know for a fact, I think if you look at the data sheet for the i40, uh, it talks about, you know, relatively low SPI speeds for the configuration. Because when it's being configured, it's having to change muxes and do all sorts of stuff. Also, it's right into its own non-volatile memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, SRAM, et cetera. So, it tends to work at relatively low speed. I think it's like sub 15 megahertz. So you can't really go above that because it won't program reliably. Uh, it will drop bits or whatever, or you get corruptions. So that's another problem that we have because we wouldn't want to run QSPI at that speed. Um, so we have ourselves a bit of a conundrum here. Um, Laurie says, which are the QSPI pins in the ILB schematics? I can see SS, SCK, SI, SO. Which are the other two pins? That You have to look at both um, diagrams. Um, I made a note of them. <laughs> I was working on it the other day. Um, basically... Um, so yes, you can see the SS, the SCK, SI and SO signals. Those represent the QSS, QSCK, uh, QD0, QD1. And then the other two, QD2 and QD3, are actually the uh, lower byte and high byte mask pins. Um, Laurie. On that schematic can you see those two those are the upper two bits of the nipple I know it's all very confusing which is why we you know why I said the other day we've got to work out how we're going to do the naming on here because it's trying to work it out between the two schematics is pretty tricky um, But the interpretation of what those pins mean would be different on different boards, potentially. Unlike, you know, SS, SCK, SO, SI, which are more self-explanatory. Um, right. So where was I? So how do we solve this problem? Again, we're back to that old issue of wanting to be able to use pins differently in different scenarios even though they're the same physical pins on the STM32 um, we want to use them in different ways so what we'd like to do is bit bang when we're programming and then use the QSPI peripheral when we're when we finish programming and we're doing the normal you know high speed higher data rate communications with the ICE-40 once we've got something synthesized in it after programming. Um, and if you remember that, um, and if you've ever used uh, Rust Embedded, you'll know that the GPIO configuration uses things such as type state, which basically renders each instance of a pin and its function as its own type. So if we look at how this is uh, defined here, so when we're bit banging, these pins are defined as basically that particular pin, 
which is configured as an output in push-pull mode. Um, not configured, you know, as the QCK, if you like, the clock for uh, the uh, QSPI peripheral, which would have an entirely different type. And you can't move, you can't assign one to the other. It is literally, they are incompatible types. However, I believe it can be done. There is a way. Um, what I was doing, I was looking at, well, what happens in the occasion where you want to be able to change a GPIO pin from input to output? Because there are many protocols where you might need to bit bang that. And if you go back a while um, and think about some of the stuff we were doing in the early days with the uh, embedded bus, that was one of the questions that um, I hadn't answered. Subsequently, I have found uh, there, there is a way of doing that. So what you can do is you can temporarily reconfigure the pin into a new type. And then you must take it back when you finish using it back into the old type. Um, and it's got to be clear for the compiler to be able to see that. And you'd effectively have two two uh, variable representations of the same pin and effectively what you're doing in Rust is it's actually called a move. You are moving it from one to the other. So you can do it. So what we will be able to do potentially here and what I'm looking at doing is being able to use this very same pin in a kind of soft SPI or in a QSPI, but the state machine around how that happens is somewhat complicated. Now, I'm not going to tackle that this evening because it would take too long, and I'm still looking at the best ways of um, arranging that and the best pattern to use in order to do that safely. And I'm sure I'm probably going to get some issues with the compiler complaining. Um, about not knowing which mode the pin is in and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's going to be a bit of fun working out how to do that. But I think it's possible. Um, just for the completeness, there is another way to solve this that isn't software. Okay. So one of the other ways I thought is, I know we're if we look at the pins we're using here, we're using SCK, Mozzie, SS, and Reset. So when we configure the same pin here, this SS pin becomes a QSS pin when we're in QSPI mode. It's the same physical pin, just different function. Now that is the logical way of arranging it when you think about it, right? However, I have another pin in there which we use for events and interrupts, which is a way for the IS40 to notify the STM32 that it needs attention, i.e. that it's got data or something's changed um, in the QSPI conversation. Um, uh, in the interrupt scenario, that could be, it pulls down the interrupt, the STM32 then basically examines a particular address to find out what the root of that was and then services that interrupt effectively. So you could use it as a kind of um, uh, interrupt control, like a PIC. Um, and you could build the PIC into the logic of the uh, ICE-40. Now, what you could do here, or what I could do on the next version of this board, the final version, we're not going to do another proto, um, is rather than connecting the QSS to SS, as I've done here, I could connect the SS pin to the interrupt pin. 
because the interrupt pin is a standalone, excuse me, GPIO pin. Why would I do that? Because then when I'm doing a transaction over SPI with the ICE40, when I'm trying to program it, the I can use the interrupt pin as a select deselect pin and be able to do the functions that I mentioned earlier. Now, even though I could do that and that solves that problem, I would still have the problem that the QSBI would be terribly limited because we'd have to knock the frequency down to lower than 15 megahertz. So we'd kind of be shooting ourselves in the foot. I mean, there is a possibility that we could dynamically change the divider and accelerate, you know, give it a boost after we program it, we change the divisor and then it works at a higher frequency. Now, I don't know uh, if A, that works, or B, that's a good idea, because normally you set the divisor up when you configure the peripheral, and then you don't change it, unless you deconfigure it and reconfigure it again, totally. Because um, you can imagine what would happen if you were changing that and the transaction was happening, for example. Would not end well. Um, but it might be worth swapping those over just so that we had the opportunity to be able to do that as a software option if we wanted to, if that worked out. Now the advantage of that is there wouldn't be any bit banging apart from the select and deselect. Um, and it would just ignore what was going on on the other pin because that's not connected to SS anymore. That's connected to the pin that's currently connected to the interrupt pin. So I'd literally swap the QSS and interrupt pins. Because they can be anywhere. They don't have to be on a particular port on the FPGA. They're not particularly fast in that sense. So it may be an optimization that we can do that gives us a few more options in software later as well. So I may well do that. Um, consider yourself informed about this particular problem and the options we have for it and I will continue to work on this offline. Um, I can't try the interrupt and QSS swapping, not without seriously hacking the boards, but I could swap it for next time because there'd be no real downside to doing that. Um, the object would be in the short term for this board is getting soft SPI working and QSPI working and be able to have some sort of good state machine that controls the operation of both of those, even though they're effectively called from the same USB, you know, uh, receive function, the WAM point receive function. Uh, let me just catch up on the comments. Um, uh, Laurie's saying he can read it. That's good. I mean, if anyone wants it larger, let me know and I can make it larger. Um, Laurie also says, people working on retro computers use these. Yeah, I have seen that before. Very fancy. Again, I'm not sure how well that work on these tiny pins, but maybe. It's quite difficult to clear. You know, you can suck up most of the solder, but you've got to clear it well enough so that the pin isn't stuck in internally or on the other side. If you looked at the solder for that um, um, that connector, it went all the way through. So there was solder on both sides. So it, it would still be very tricky. But yeah. I don't do much desoldering to be quite honest. Not not of that skill. It's probably not worth me investing in that at the moment. But yeah. The other option to have, excuse me, I'm yawning. 
sorry, I didn't sleep much last night because I had um, something else going through my head to do with this actually, which I'll get onto a bit later. Um, and I was up at the crack of dawn as well this morning, so um, yeah, bad combination really. So um, hopefully that clears up where we are with programming the ICE 40. At the moment I can program it, but I can't use the QSPI, obviously, because I've got it in the bitbang mode or GPIO mode for those pins, so I can't use the QSPI, but I will solve that. But I'm not intending doing any QSPI stuff today. Um, what I want to do is just basically I need to look at uh, make sure that the rest of the stuff is working so let's switch over to that but bef before I do is there any questions around the black crap stuff because I'm going to move off this now because we have a working version that's good enough for us to program the ice 40 which we're going to move on to now we're going to move on to the HDL or the uh, amaranth side any questions? I'm going to get refreshment in the meantime. Oh dear, tea's nearly gone. That's it. It's gone onto the waters. Fast up. Um, and I need to talk about connectors as well. Yeah, don't let me forget to go on to the connectors later, and in particular, mixed mods, P mods. I need to circle back round to the hardware. Maybe we do it at the end after we've done some um, some of the Amaranth stuff and some of the testing. So, um, I don't see any questions. Uh, so, let's just move on. Um, God, I just had a, um, a, um, <laughs> a sudden dread that I hadn't pressed record, but I have. Um, right, let's switch to the Amaranth. So what we have now, so we now know, what do we know? We now know that the SPI communication is happening and the reset is happening and I can reprogram the ICE 40, which is very, very important. So we now know there's a bunch of things working. Um, something else that I left last time, um, if we look carefully um, at what we do here, The other thing that we know is working is um, this. Um, the LED on the uh, Black Ice NXT mezzanine board, there's an RGB LED on there. And the way that that's wired is there are internally there are three cathodes one for red one for green and one for blue and they have a common anode which is pulled up to excuse me three volts three volt three now the green led is automatically grounded right so when the board is powered that green led comes on okay very important so we know when it's powered it's quite important to have a power signal. The mode button, okay, from the STM32 mode output is connected to the cathode of the red part of the RGB LED. So if we turn that on, because green is already on, we don't get red, we get orange or amber which is a combination of the green and the red. Uh, and I think I showed that last time. Um, so when I set this here, I'm saying that we're in amber mode. Um, we may or may not be, 
um, we have to decide what that means but I just wanted to show as of last time that that works I think we also had it turning on and off in this little loop here as well so basically we know that's working as well so we know that um, we're setting the uh, LED mode after we've configured everything else such as the USB etc etc uh, but I also know that the SPI I'm sorry the USB is working as well because I've got that I've tested that and we're not using a QSPI which is why it's disabled okay um, because we're already using the pins as soft SPI that means we can then program okay the other pin of the RGB LED on the Black Ice NXT uh, mezzanine board is wired to one of the GPIO pins. If you remember, we had on there a uh, ESP32 C3 mini module, um, which I didn't have, so I couldn't actually fit that. So we're not actually using that blue LED at this point in time. Uh, and I'll come back round to my plans for the ESP32 as well. Um, so that's the LED operating and giving us the status feedback on the board. So we know it's powering up. We measured the voltages last week. We also measured the voltages on the FPGA board as well as the 5 volt, 3 volt free, we had the 1.2 volt working, so it should all be hunky dory. Because we've already used the Bitbang soft SPI code to program the ICE FPGA, assuming that all the connections are in place and everything's connected correctly, we should be able to program it in a normal manner now. And I did a quick test, and that does work. So let's do that first. So if we look at the um, let me just reduce the size of this so that you can see. So this is here, uh, Black Crab telling us it's running and everything's hunky-dory. Uh, and we're connected to it through the STM link V3 using the, um, you know, the... Uh, um, remangled connector on the top of the board this one here okay so I don't know if we can see it now so the next thing I want to do is switch over to the Amaranth uh, code bear with me we just changed the window on here now what Back, 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 back. That's weird. Why does it think it's got that on? I'm going to turn that off for the moment because we don't need that. Um, ID. Let's get rid of that. Uh, let's go into the ID. Oh, that's very annoying. Why does it show me that? It does confuse me, OBS, sometimes. So it's selected something other than what's currently live, which is a bit confusing. But what I'm going to do is just change over now to the other IDE um, window, which is, hopefully, Blinky, if I can find it on here. There we go. So now, how, how are we for size? Is this readable? So this is our simple um, blinky example in Amaranth. Okay. Um, you'll remember this from our work we did with the boards, the previous version of the board. When we were working on the kind of lab notebook. A very simple piece of um, HDL. 
Um, first of all, I import the stuff I need from Amaranth. Then I import the board file. Uh, this is a little different, uh, how I've got it configured at the moment. So this is sitting in a separate directory. Rather than using the Amaranth forwards directory, I'm using my own MyStorm boards uh, repository for the moment because I'm making continuous changes to this. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm bringing in the ICE Logic Bus, um, which is the name of the ICE 40 board that uh, our mezzanine is sitting on, that has the ICE 40 on it. And the ICE Logic Bus defines at least some of the, the pinouts. So I've already converted this. So let's have a quick look at that. But well, in fact, let's go back to that in a minute. Let's just remember what we're doing here first. So it, all, all this uh, Blink does, First, we go and pick up something called the LED resource, which is connected to a certain pin. Again, that's defined in the board file, which we'll go to in a minute. We create a 24-bit timer. Um, we get a module. Um, we increment the timer on each clock cycle. Um, and uh, we then basically connect up the LED state to the highest pin, the most significant bit of the timer. Okay, so that gives us a nice division because don't, don't forget that the clock we're using here is running at something like 25 megahertz. That clock comes in from the STM32 uh, master clock out into the FPGA and that's defined as the default clock. And because we've not been specific about using a particular clock, it uses a default clock, which happens to be this 25 megahertz signal. We're dividing that down by 2 to the 24, effectively. Um, so the LED will flash. Okay. Um, so that is all it takes to blink the LED. Uh, then what we do is we use the... Uh, Amara, the ICE Logic Bus platform, our definition of those board files, etc. Um, and we build uh, this, we synthesize it, and because we've got do program true, we also output that um, over the serial port. The serial port in this case is our firmware instance that's running, i.e. Black Crab, running on the mezzanine board, which then serializes it over USB because it comes up as a serial USB, a CDC class USB and it serializes that to the USB part of Black Crab which then you know sends chunks of bytes to the send, the SPI send which reprograms the uh, ICE40. So very simple. So let's have a look at the board file. It's not finished, not by, I mean, basically I started with the previous board file, which was the ICE Logic Bench, or was it the ICE Logic Deck? I forget. I think it's the ICE Logic Bench file. And I've uh, modified it somewhat. Um, so if we look at that, um, the tiles are, are very similar to what how they were before, except there's four of them rather than five because the extra pin's got the mezzanine, not to what we had before, which was a super tile, if you remember. Um, I've gotten rid of some of the extra pinouts that are used on the super tile, for example. Those are on the mezzanine, but I'm not defining any of those. I'm just keeping things simple. So here I have the LED, so I know what pin that's connected to. So remember on the, um, on the ICE Logic bus board, there is again another RGB LED, and the way that's configured is it has one pin which is connected to power, which is a green pin, uh, it has another pin which is a blue pin which is connected to this J11 ball on the FPGA, and it has a red one in it which is connected to the DUN signal. So when you start it up, what happens is the done signal, because the ICE 40 is not programmed, that is pulled down. So the red LED is engaged. Also, the green LED is engaged because that's connected directly to ground because that's indicating power. And the blue LED isn't 
being driven because it's in a tri-state, because the FPGA hasn't been programmed. We don't have any synthesis there yet. So the colour we get out is amber, which is a combination of the green, which is always on, and the red from the done signal. So that's how it starts off. So if you were to look uh, at the board, you'd see the orange of the STM32 mezzanine board, the Black Ice NXT board, that is an orange, that RGB LED. Likewise, uh, the FPGA LED is also orange. Confusing much, but let's just leave it there for the moment. We'll come back round to that. So um, the next thing I'm defining here, uh, I'm not defined a UART. Again, I want to talk about that later. Um, the SPI pins are enumerated here. Those are the pins I talked about. They're also shared with it being programmed. Those are the very same pins. Um, and we have four tiles defined. Each one has 12 of the FPGA IOs, digital IOs. Um, the gen pins, because when you define the pinouts, you have to deal with the fact that there's a bunch of uh, signals on the connector for the tiles that are nothing to do with the FPGA that carry signals from the STM32, such as the I squared C signal, uh, reset, enable, and the mix signal pins, such as the ADC stroke GPIO pins. So we have to account for those in our pin configurations. So those are considered kind of don't cares or ignore these from the Amaranth point of view. Um, these are wrong. We should just ignore those. Those are from the previous one. Now obviously the name has changed here to bus platform rather than bench. And what we can then, uh, then do is assemble um, things like tile resources. So if we look at a tile resource here, that is made up of the tile definition, okay, tile one in this case, plus the gem pins. Remember, those are all the pins that aren't connected to the FPGA, but have to be accounted for. So it's the same pattern for all of them here, for the four tiles. The mezzanine, forget those, because those are not enumerated properly at this point in time. Uh, the other thing that we have here configured is the default clock. Uh, here we're saying that it's called clock 25 because it actually runs at 25 megahertz. Uh, although we could actually set that to whatever we want in the STM32, but by default it's 25 megahertz. Um, and we're creating this clock resource and we're saying it's a global attribute because it uses um, uh, a connection on the FPGA that has global routing inside. It's good for routing a signal to many different things. Okay, So we're defining that type. We're also saying what speed it is. I, that is wrong, actually. That should be 25. Let's go back to that. Uh, I'm probably going to mess things up. Let's just change that now. I must remember. The old 16 megahertz was before we fixed the master control output to use the external oscillator. Um, and we're also saying which pin that we're using. And this is actually different here. So when we say, yeah, it's different from the one that we had before. And it's an input pin because it's being driven from the STM32 to the ICE40. So it's an external signal that's coming in. Um, the other thing that we've defined as a resource here is the LED, as we mentioned before. Okay. And there's nothing special about that. It's the standard, you know, low voltage CMOS, 3 volt for 8 pin. <coughs> We've also laid out the SPI signals if we need to use those, because it's common to do that. In this case, we're not really using that anymore. <coughs> and this doesn't exist either, so that's probably going to go as well. But it's, it's, some of these things are left in here um, from the last version. Um, there's an important bit here. This is how we program it. This is how we tell it 
to actually output the synthesized uh, FPGA bit image or bit file. Uh, this is where we're sending it to. This is a problem because this needs to be more dynamic. I need to find a better way of doing this, but it's fixed at the moment. Um, so that's where we send it to. Um, uh, we say we're programming it and then we're t saying what we're programming, which, which in this case it's a Unix device, it's a serial device. Um, and then it takes the binary format of that and it basically serializes it. Um, it, it calls the basically copy uh, operating system, copy function, and takes the binarized bitstream file and copies it out the serial device. Very simple. Again, we'll come back to this stuff later because that may change somewhat. So that's our um, boards file. Um, there's enough in it for it to work, basically, at this point. Um, but it is not complete, so we might need to round back to this at some point to get it working properly. There might be enough there for what we need to do today, though, I think. Uh, sorry if this is a bit repetitive and boring if you already know this stuff, but there might be people that haven't seen this, you know, what a board file looks like in Amaranth, how it's defined. You may have seen a PCF file used for Verilog and the likes, but not necessarily a board file. Um, and basically, this is a Python file, an Amaranth Python file. So, back to Blinky. Um, so we pick up that platform and then we build and program using that platform. Okay, so I've just defined a function here that does that and then I can call that function. So we can do that on the command line, but that's doing it on the command line is a little bit of a pain. Particularly when you're experimenting with stuff and changing stuff. And given the other things that we're going to need to do moving forward, there's better ways. So let me introduce you to using using it directly in Python. So first of all, we make sure you know on the command line that we have access to the serial port. That's fairly important before we do any of this. So after we bring the firmware up, we have to do this. So once Black Crab's up, we've got to make sure that that device is accessible to us and configured in the right way. We can then go to a Python console. So if I look at this blink here. Let me just copy all of this here. Then I'm going to use um, the um, I'm, I'm in fact before I do this. Let me I don't need that there. Let's just increase the size here because this is teeny tiny. No, it's funny, isn't it? It doesn't increase those sizes, but increases this. Hmm. Let's make it a bit smaller. So I'm going to copy and paste that code into my Python console. Now this is in PyCharm's console, which is slightly different to the regular Python console. It has some advantages. But let's just ignore that difference for a moment. So I'm just going to paste that code into here. Enter it. Straight away, on the right-hand side here, I can see all of the uh, things that exist in this Python uh, instance that I've just created here, which is kind of useful for examining them if you need to. Um, so, for example, if I look at that class I've created, Blink, here, I can see uh, very little, actually, because it's not obvious. Um, but I can see things like... Um, most of these are actually um, Amaranth stuff, but I can see things like my logic bus pl for platform, the things I've defined there. I want to go and dig down into that so I could go and look at the resources, for example, see my clock, the LEDs, etc. etc. So it's kind of useful. You can examine these things. Um, I know you can do it in the IDE, sorry, in the console itself, but it's quite nice to have that function here on the right hand side, which is why I like it. So we're in Python now. We've taken Blinky and its imports, and these imports are defined so I can use them in here. Um, now all I need to do is call this synth 
and it will build and program the device. So I'm going to just turn my light off here. I don't know if it's dark enough for us to see the um, LEDs. The light coming from the LEDs, sorry. Um, it's on this side here. On the um, ST Link side. The trouble is, these cables are in the way, which doesn't make it very clear. Is that more obvious? You can just see on here, you can see there's an orange shadow. That's from the um, black ice mezzanine board. Then on this side here, what you can probably see, I think, is just green. I mean, to make it easier, I could probably stand it up like this, maybe. Excuse the wires. Uh, I try not to jog the table too much. Um, damn it. That is not really very clear at all. Let me throw the lighting. Sorry. You can see the orange there just. I can't see the green. Well, you can't see the orange for... Okay, hold on. Maybe if I take this from that side. Is that more obvious? Just trying to find an angle where you can see the um, LEDs. So if I have it this way around, what we're interested in and this is going to be difficult to see. Damn, these cables are annoying. They always get wrapped around in a way we don't like. So if we look at this LED here, so the LED there is for the STM32 side, which is kind of orangey colour. And then the LED for the FPGA is this side. And again, it's kind of an orangey colour as well. Although that's not entirely clear. I don't know if I can do it like that. Now, as I said before, the reason that it's that colour is the done signal is being pulled low because the ICE-40 is not being programmed. So the red LED part of the RGB LEDs on and the green LED is always pulled down to ground because it indicates the power on the FPGA board. I'm probably going to change that but let's just forget that for the moment that's why it's orange. Now what I'm going to do is in the console I'm going to run synth to synthesize this. Okay what should happen is that that should program, and it's not very clear that that's happening, I'm afraid, and I want to make that clearer, which is one of the things I want to change. Um, it will program the FPGA with any luck, and it should, this LED on this side here, should go green. In other words, the done signal should extinguish after a successful programming. So let's do that. Yeah, it's telling us the device that it's programming. Voila! That's good. Now if you look carefully, this is now actually not just green, it's going slightly bluish. Can you see? If you look very carefully, you'll see it's actually changing subtly. And it is rather subtle. What's happening is The green is still on, the done is extinguished, so it's not amber anymore, but we're also blinking the blue LED at the same time. Now, unfortunately, the difference between blue 
and green, i.e. green on by itself and green with blue on, which gives you a kind of turquoise, is very subtle. So even though it's blinking right now, what it's doing is it's blinking the blue part of the LED, but the green LED is remaining um, illuminated. So the change you see is actually very small. Um, it's quite strange actually, when you're looking at it directly, it's very difficult to tell. If you look at it in the corner of your eye, you tend to see it more when you're near it. I don't think that will work over the stream very easily, but I don't know if it's detectable, whether you can see that it's changing. Forget the, um, let me see if I can cover the um, debugger. So it's distracting. I don't know whether it's possible to see if that's working or not. I wonder if I can um, do something like this, maybe. To show it up. If this will make it more. Well, that makes the LED more visible, but I don't know if it helps in discerning between um, green and blue. I can see the flashing LED fairly clearly. What, between blue and green? That's good. Yeah, you can see it a bit easier now with the diff diffusing on top. So that is it. That's us running um, Blinky on the ICE 40 as programmed from the Black Crab firmware, which is running on the STM32. So that gives us a good round trip. So we know that that's working now and that's working well. As I say, the choices of colours and things don't make this particularly um, good choice, in my opinion. What, I've, what I'm thinking of doing, actually, is um, we already know whether it's powered, because they both, both the STM32 mezzanine board, the Black Ice NXT board, and the FPGA board share the free volt free. Um, so if one works, the other should, assuming the connection's there. So having the odd, having the green LED work on the STM32 is probably good enough. We don't need to know that there's power on the FPGA board. So what I might do, instead of connecting that um, green LED to the um, to ground directly, so we know it's on power, is I might take it to the CS pin on the ICE40. Why would I want to do that? Because then the pin will change state when we're programming it slightly. So it will give us another indication of programming to illuminate when we're programming. Um, and that is an aid for from a diagnostic point of view. But as soon as it's finished programming, assuming we're not sending anything over SPI at this point, in our synthesis, then uh, the CS pin will go high again and the LED will switch off because the LEDs are active low in this case. They're, we're controlling the cathodes of the LED. That way the green won't be on when we blink the blue LED and it will be much clearer. So if it then succeeds, what you will see is just the blue LED going on and off, which would be far more suitable in my um, humble opinion. And if we also do the QSS interrupt swap, we'll only ever see the green LED in programming or briefly on an interrupt until the interrupt serviced, um, which could be another aid potentially for debug. Um, so that's, what, that's an obvious improvement I'd like to make um, on the next round. And it's a fairly simple one to do. But there you go, you can see that um, operating. So we programmed the ICE40 and we ran our Blinky code um, using the onboard resources on the uh, ICE logic bus. Voila, and we've used Black Crab 
firmware, the Rust firmware, to actually achieve that from the STM32. So we know all of that's working, we've got our round trip now. So we can then move on and start working on something else. So this much I already knew. Um, so the next stage is to look at the functionality of the other pins that we have on the device and make sure that those are working. So um, I'm going to lie this down now because we don't need to see that. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to put this. Um, let me have a look. What am I going to do? I want to use. Um, I if I can do it this way. Just going to rotate things around a little. of these things out of the way and see if we can put it in a position that we can see here. Let me illuminate it a bit more now. Now the tile that I put in place here is the um, it's the tile is the tile equivalent of this P mod, basically, but it's a new version. So what differs between this, um, if we look at the old version and the way that the tiles worked on the old version, so if you remember the old Proto from December, the one that we've been using up to now. Ta -da. You can see that we've got the uh, tile on here. Now remember on this version, on the older version, the active elements on the tile, some of the tiles, were facing away from the logic board. That's all flipped now and we're using these apertures here to allow those to be visible from the top. So that, that tile has changed slightly, but the pinouts are the same. Um, what do I want to do actually? Let's do that one that way. Actually, it looks to be around this way, doesn't it? That's the way we want it. Move all this cabling out of the way. Damn it. Don't you just hate cabling? So, here what we can see now is that the tile is mounted on the other side of the ICE Logic Bus. So we've got a sandwich. At the top we've got the uh, mezzanine, the STM32 based um, black ice next board on top. Then we've got the ice logic bus. And then underneath that we've got the tiles which mount onto that and face upward through the apertures. So what we're looking at here is an ice tile. Uh, let me think, where are we? Yes. An ice tile fitted here, but we can see all the way through the aperture down so we can see the display, in this case for the seven segment tile, which is kind of cool. So um, let's switch to the seven segment. Um, I put it in position four. I think that's actually position four. I know it's confusing for the way up that I have it, but that is actually tile four in this particular configuration because I've got it kind of upside down. So it's the right way up for you guys. 
Um, so let me just remind you of our seven segment code. Um, normal Amaranth imports. We're bringing in the um, MyStore, MySlogic bus board file. Um, I'm then bringing in the tile seven segment library that we created before. That's not changed. The pinout's the same. Um, both from the resource point of view and also the controller. And then our simple example, all it does is it creates a new seven segment controller. Uh, we create the A to G segment drivers, seven of those. Um, in this case, we're calling them LEDs seven. Um, we're getting a timer, 40 bit timer in this case. And what we're doing is we're incrementing that timer and then we're connecting up those LED segments um, to the seven LEDs, which are the internal, which is the internal signals of the seven segment uh, module that we've created up here that's in the tile library. Um, we're then doing some more complex stuff here. I'm not going to go through this. So we're taking a higher part of the free bits to control our segment counting. Uh, and what we're doing is we're enumerating three different cases of that here because we want to be able to drive the digits serially from digit zero, digit two, digit three. Uh, I think it's that way around, digit zero digit two, digit three, or digit one, two, and three. Um, so we're using three bits to control that. Um, and we're enumerating that. And then what we're doing is we're counting up. Again, we're taking values off that timer. We're taking a slice of those timer pins to control uh, the individual segments. We need four of each. Okay, four pins of each. Um, then again we've got our simp function and all that does, first of all it adds in the resources, the tile resources that we want here because um, we need to tell it which tile we want that connected to in this case it's tile 4 um, so we bring that in to the resources and then we do the build ok so let's copy that code the gate where the HDL, the Amaranth, if you like, let's copy that. Let's go back to our Python console. Let's paste that in. And then again, we should be able to run synth. Uh, Bingo. There we go. In fact, let's just, that's quite bright. Let's see if we can. We have our counting uh, tile. So that tile is working. Now, um, I had to resolder the tile connectors on here. Um, so it's probably worth spending some time on this. I had to hand resolder the tile connectors. Now, the tile connectors. <coughs> are uh, this kind of pitch which is a 1.27 mil pitch it's half a 0 0.1 inch header pitch and they're very fine but we have the surface mount versions of those uh, if you remember from last time the problem I had when I constructed the ice logic board is it's a double sided board so you've got all the kind of clever components on the top such as the ice 40 switch mode regulators, the series resistors um, for damping the lines, etc. or impedance matching the lines, and the upper connectors for the mezzanine. But the tiles connect on the bottom side. There's also some decoupling stuff as well underneath the BGA. Now those uh, female uh, connectors, 
that sit on the bottom, one for each tile, because there's four tiles, when I reflowed them, they actually fell off. So even though the paste holds them on when it's cold, when it heated up, it became so liquid, it, there wasn't enough surface tension to hold the weight of the connectors. So um, unfortunately, they fell off. So basically, even though the top was reflowed perfectly, the underside was basically, um, you know, um, a pig's dinner. Basically, it was a, it was a right mess. Uh, in fact, all of the connectors fell off apart from one, which was still connected on one side, hanging on by a thread, which made it really awkward to sort out. Now, unfortunately, these connectors are difficult um, to reheat again because they're liable to melting, particularly when you're using a hot air pencil to try and fix things. So I half fixed them with a combination of the hot air pencil and stuff, but that wasn't good enough. I know that some of the connections were bad. So I had to go over today with the, you know, the good old uh, soldering iron and lots of flux um, in order to get much better connections on them. which I duly did, so I'm confident that those are pretty good, although one of them I know is slightly dodgy, because unfortunately it's at a slight angle, it's slightly twisted, um, so when you put the tile on and try and fit one in, it's twisted and it's under tension and that's not good. Um, whilst we're on the subject of these things falling off, I was saying this will be a process problem for the manufacturing, because how do you make sure that you get these on? So what I'm going to do, I thought of a solution for this. So let's let's talk about that. I know it's a bit of a squirrel, but it's important. Um, ouch! Just caught my finger. Um, I need a prop. Prop, prop, prop. If you remember. <laughs> One of the tiles I made was a double tile. Let me just show you what that looks like raw, actually. Um, and this is a kind of multi-purpose uh, tile, and I was debating whether I, I make these available for a number of reasons. I probably will. Do. Now, one of the things... So let me show you the tile first so you can see what I'm talking about. So here is the active side of the tile. So at the top here you have the tile connector. Now in this case, this is a double-sided board. I know it looks like two small ones, but it's actually one board that covers two tiles. Okay, let's see if we can get a, a better um, focus on this. This hand's probably easier. Try not to get the reflection too much. So on the top you've got the mezzanine connectors, okay? Up here. Then you've got a proto area, so it acts as a proto board. Then at the bottom you've got some connection patterns. Now these connection patterns are chosen purposefully and I'll, I'll come back around to those in a minute. But the point is when you put this on, right, it fits to those two mezzanine tile connectors. One, two. So my thinking here is what I could do is if I pre-reflow these with the male connectors then after I've made, after I've populated the ice logic board with everything other than the tile female connectors, what I do is I take two of these pre-populated with the males and I fit onto the males a female on each one. And I have two of these and then I put that onto, with spacers, metal ones, not. Not nylon ones because they're melt in the reflow process. 
put those on top, screw them down onto the board, turn it back over. Then when I put it in the oven, the connectors will be sandwiched between the two boards held together, spaced by the spacer and held together by screws so that they will not fall off. Bob's your uncle, that should solve the problem. The other advantage of doing this is the alignment should be perfect. Or as good as the alignment on one of these, because they should align nicely. And aligning this is pretty tricky because it takes up more than one tile. Aligning one tile is much easier than trying to align two. If you try to align four, it'd be even more difficult. So that's my plan. Um, if I was really brave, in one foul swoop, I could actually reflow the males on here at the same time as the females on the other. But that may be some refinement in the production. But yeah, that could save some time. Now, um, that solves the problem. Um, so that I don't have to jump through the fiery hoops I've had to in order to get these connectors working on the bottom of the first prototype I made. Now, the other thing that these can do, now obviously these can be used for prototyping. If you've used any of the mix mods or P mods that we tend to sell um, along with the uh, black ice boards, um, you'll be familiar with these kind of prototype boards. It's so that you can knock something up in hardware, solder it on, or you can just do patches to different connectors, etc. They're really, really useful, very popular. Most people buy them that have a soldering iron. Uh, they're only the the only the only mix mod that was more popular than the um, proto patch ones were the Bripple ones. So, um, but we're going one step further here because the other thing I've done is I've wired in to these connectors. Let me show you a made one. Right, what you can do is you can add. The correct connectors on here and if you look closely you should notice that those connectors if I can get it to focus on the bottom you'll see are a mix mod here and a P mod double P mod so you can actually use the very same board, either as a prototype patch board or as a tile to P mod, mix mod adapter, all in one board. How cool is that? And I think these will probably be the most popular attachment with it. How cool is that? Um, There are some other little connector sockets on the bottom here that I haven't used. Those are a pair of two row four pins uh, with grounded on one side. And those are perfect for connecting your logic analyzer to. If you want to expose the logic signals. And it shares the pins with this double P mod here. So effectively, it also acts like a P mod extender. All in one board. Pretty cool, huh? Excuse me, my phone's just gone off. Who is messaging me now? It's weird. Oh, this is earlier. At the moment, I call these uh, proto mod boards. Might want a better name, I don't know. They're actually a double tile. When I don't use the word tile in the names, so maybe I should, I don't know. How cool are those? So they these will, I think, be very popular. And... Um, also useful for the manufacturing process itself, which is a bonus. 
Like you can see the naming there for Everfocuses. Okay. So I thought I'd cover that. Um, now I've gone off on one. I've forgotten where I was. Let me have a drink once I think about it. So I've got a solution to the manufacturing problem. Uh, I redid the tile connectors. I think three of them are good. Tile two looks dodgy, so I'm going to avoid that. But um, that means we can go ahead and test all the connectivity, which is kind of cool. Um, what's next, what's next, what's next? Any questions on that stuff so far? And we're still counting in hex, look below. How are we doing for time? I don't think it's going to be a late one tonight. You're doing okay. We're going to need some energy shortly. Right. Um, so that's tile four. That's working. Um, I can then use that same tile on a different slot. Um, let's try it. In tile three, I need to be careful when I'm disconnecting this because I could um, upset things. These aren't what I'd really call hot swappable, but it is possible with some tiles. So I now move that over to. Three. and I've turned it round so it still looks the right way up for you guys tile 3 so if I go on cables are pushing it let's go to the code I'm just going to change this tile 3 Select it all, and I'm just gonna in fact, can I do it here? If I wonder what happens if I do tile equals three. Then I should be able to do synth. Yay! Simples. So I didn't have to copy and paste it again. Nice. So it's now working in tile three. All those numbers and letters look good, so that's a good sign. Uh, tile three. Right, let's do, um, oh, Laurie's just said something. Um, what tiles do you have? The double one? The uh, seven segment, which others? Yeah, I, I haven't put the others together yet. Um, I just haven't had time, Laurie. But I will do those in the next few weeks. Um, or the next few streaming sessions or whatever. So yeah, I've got a motor tile. Oh, let me remind you what I've got. I have to remind myself because I've forgotten. Um, I've got, let me just show you again. What tiles do I have? I have 
uh, the VGA tile, which isn't populated yet, so I'll need to test that with the tile library we did provide. In fact, it's going to be different because there's more bits in this, more color bits than the last one because there's no audio on here. Why is that not focusing? Because there's so much stuff behind me. So yeah, the uh, BGA time we've got to do. Um, we also have the motor tile. An exciting one. Probably going to do that one last, actually. Damn it! God damn you, focus! motor tile. Um, I'm still in two minds about the connectors on here as well. Oh, that reminds me, um, so the connectors I have on here are normal through hole screw connectors for the motors. Uh, one of the things I'm looking at is these. I ordered a bunch of these. Um, these are from uh, an alley supplier. They're a 0.1 pitch and we've got a good spacing for things like protos. Got it on an old P mod proto there. And there's no screws, you just press the button or you just push the wire in. So thus and then it's locked in. However, I'm not that impressed by the locking. I mean it works well enough. I'm not sure how mechanically robust robust that locking is. So those are good, I've got a bunch of those. I might use. I don't know whether to use them on a finished product or not yet, because I'm worried because you can pull them out. So the, um, the clamping isn't brilliant in my opinion. They're good for prototyping. So I might use those on the motor tile, I don't know, um, to replace the screwing ones, because screwing ones aren't good mechanically. Uh, so what we've done, we've done the motor tile. Um, Seven segment tile, which you've already seen. That's just a tile version of it, unpopulated. Um, we know that's working because we've pop actually populated that one. And we also have. HDMI tile, which we need to try as well. It's going to be fun. That's HDMI and audio. Kind of full size HDMI connector, yeah. digital video. Um, so those are the only tiles we've got, and I've got a few of those to populate, and we do those in various streams over the next um, few weeks or so. But the only one I've got made up at the moment are the double tile and the um, seven segment one. 
which you see running now. So let's change again. Let's see if we can do. So we've done three and four. Let's do, so that's four. Let's try the dodgy one, which is tile two. It's a bit of a struggle to fit it in because it's at a slight angle. It's going to make a contact. Rotate it so you can see it. Um, I'd say two, wasn't it? Uh, two. Let's synthesize it again. Um, it's programmed it correctly. Not coming up with any error. Clearly, I did say that was dodgy. That tile connector. Is it not in properly? That is tile two, isn't it? Maybe I'll put it in tile one. <laughs> oh god. Better try tile one. Confusing. I need to name these. It'll probably be easier. Something else that we need to um, do it with. Let's try um, tile one. Just in case I mix myself up. Yeah, I put it in the wrong one. Idiot. Confused myself. So, tile one's working, which is good. And all the segments are there, which is nice. But that's up there down for you guys. <laughs> oh, these wires getting so tangled up. Cool. And let's try then, so that's one, so let's try two. I mean these should slip on nice and easy, they do when it's uh, properly aligned, but because of my bit of a fuck up, um, when I assembled this, might not be quite so good. So this is now tile two, I hope. I hope I'll get it right this time. Uh, there is something happening there. <laughs> I told you it was dodgy. This tile place, oh yeah, if I move it, can you see it actually starts to um, work? God, it's really weird. There we go. Oh. Yeah, if I hold it in place, it works nicely. Yeah, it's just not making contact properly. Some, it's got, there is a contact problem on at least one or two maybe of the um, conductors. I have to hold it at an angle for it to work. But what that tells me is apart from my shabby assembly on that particular connector is that all the IOs God that's awful. I'm not going to use that Unless I can reposition that. Um... Oh, almost had it then. Have it at an angle. Get it working. I'm just worried I'm going to end up resetting this if I'm not careful. 
shorting something. Hmm. Let's put that back. Oh! It felt warm. Why did I feel that was warm? So what was that tile to? I put it back I think on tile four. Less dodgy one. And we've gone all the way around the clock. And we're back where we started. Cool. So, um, apart from that dodgy connector, all those IOs seem to be, you know, well connected and complementous, apart from my dodgy tile connector on number two. Yay. Good. Good stuff. We like it that how we doing for time, yeah we're good. So that's good. So what do we know now? All the tiles are working apart from our dodgy number two, but we know that's just down to the connector. It's not down to the rest of the board. So it's just shite reflow. Um, that was the one where it was hanging off, half soldered on. Yeah. Um, so good, 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 good. We've got that. Um, we know that spy works as well. Um, the only other thing that we could test, and I'm at two minds doing this. I've been falling out with this a bit. Let me let's deal with that. We've got how long have we got? I think another twenty minutes. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about this because this has turned into a bugbear for me. So remember earlier I said we've now got the these tiles that will either act as protos, testers or adapters for PMODs. But we've also got PMODs on the boards. I remind you, let's just get the light levels up. You can see that they're on the black ice board on the STM32, so they come up from the mezzanine. Then they connect with these connectors here. Now this is a bit ugly, and I don't like it. And some of them are in the unstopped areas, which are easy to short. Um, not only that, the P mod, which is underneath here, sandwiched in between the ice logic bus and the STM32 board, the Black Ice NXT board, mean that it's actually slightly difficult to get to. I wonder if I can... Yeah, it's difficult to see, I'm afraid. Take my word for it. Let's just get the um, right nose down. Right. So anyhow, sandwich between the two boards are basically similar to that, which we already have on this on this board. So we've got an overkill number of um, P mods, in my opinion. Um, also, as you know, I'm not hugely enamoured by P mods mechanically. They are bit of a nightmare but also here the problem we've got is three-dimensional because of the level at which they set once you add tiles onto the bottom there suddenly your p-mod is sitting in you know in the air 
So the more I look at it, the more I think about it, the more I dislike um, having the P mods on that. And I actually would like to go a different route. Given that you can add P mods using this method, the value that we're adding putting the P mods there is debatable. Uh, the things I was thinking of using that to connect to would be the things that don't require extra power because the extra power isn't available on the PMODs. You don't get the higher voltage capabilities that you get with the tiles, you know, and the power delivery. So you probably only use them for things like connecting up, um, for example, a USB connection, possibly. Well, no, that's not a good example, actually. Um, let's think. The kind of things that you might use it for. Basically, stuff that works at free volt free, because that's the only voltage you've got in the PMOD. Okay. Um, it could be external LEDs. It could be a UART converter. It could even be a USB type converter. It could be a Wi-Fi mod or it could be something like that it tends to be the lower voltage stuff lower power stuff but it's going to jut out and it's not going to be very clever so the more I thought about this the more I thought well maybe we're wasting those IOs by exposing them as P mods when we've already got the P mod facility via the tile converters so what I'm thinking is we can return to something that I worked on oh, a year and a half, two years ago um, for connecting smaller things. Now, what kind of things am I thinking that I want to connect to the Black Ice Mezzanine board? They're the things that you don't connect via tiles, basically, to the lower voltage stuff. So, say I want to add an accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, you know, IMU, then that that would be nice to add. And PMOD is overkill for those because you either need just simple force by signals or I2C. So you don't want to waste a whole PMOD on those anyhow in many cases. Uh, what if I want to do a, you know, a 422 adapter? Again, you're only using two or three inputs, outputs, Again, using a PMOD to do that is overkill. Um, what if I want to just do a few LEDs in a certain pattern? What if I want to do, you know, uh, a Wi-Fi adapter? Then all I need really is probably six pins, you know, so I can do quad SPI to it, or I can use it for SPI plus UART plus program type thing. Um, again, you don't need the number of pins that you get um, with the PMODs. Um, so one of the ideas I had, uh, it was a couple of years ago, was to use these card connectors as a socket. Why would I use these? Well, the answer is the surface mount, so I don't need any soldering, which we have to do with PMODs. Okay, which is a pain in the ass, by the way, and increase the cost because it's an extra process. Can't be done with the original reflow. Uh, can I get this to focus? Who can do it? Very small. So, um, can I do it this way maybe? Cover my entire face with it. Oh, this is annoying. So, basically, you can make very low cost small boards have exactly those sort of peripherals and they fit in just like this SD card does only they're a bit longer 
and they click in and out of place. So these are ideal for that and they're low cost. So I can add, rather than putting P mods on there, I can add four of those and each one of those has seven pins, which could be six, six FPGA ice 40 pins in this case, and one mixed signal pin. That combination enables us to do all sorts of things. It enables us to do a Wi-Fi board that slots in, you know, based on um, something like the um, ESP32 C3 Mini, and it makes it optional, so you can add it at any time. You don't have to order it on to be soldered onto the board. So there's lots of advantages for that. If I want to do it, say a little LED board, I could do a three by three matrix, you know, like a nine LED matrix that would fit on a nice board and they're nice and easy to make. And there are all sorts of other boards. I could do a USB um, device board, um, I could do a USB C board, although it couldn't do power delivery, but as a device. Um, and that would include the extra CC pins and the S bus pins, which is nice. And that fits perfectly on one of these in terms of the number of pins and its size. Um, I could put a gyroscope, magnetometer, da da da, all of that on there. I could do encoders, I could do sensors, humidity sensors. Um, you could do the, um, uh, what do you call it, time of flight sensors. In fact, you could put more than one time of flight sensor on there if you wanted to. So I think it would be an ideal size for those, so I could use those instead of PMODs. Um, and I think that's the way I'm going to go. Um, not only that, it enables me to shrink the mezzanine, because something else that I'm not happy with here is if you look at this uh, mezzanine board, see we have these prongs at the top. We don't need any of those. That's all wasted area. And it makes this look far away. I know you can't see it here because we're looking down from the camera, but when you look at it at 3D, it looks a bit naff. So I'm going to shrink the mezzanine slightly, lose those forks and have it screw in closer to the actual logic board. Not only that, but it reduces the uh, cost of the PCB as well. So it's an added bonus. And it will leave enough room on either parameter side for mounting uh, these slide in uh, micro cards or whatever we call them. I think when I originally came up with the idea, it was micro blades. I'm not the first. People have made, commonly made things like uh, Wi Fi versions um, that go in card sockets, JTAG adapters, um, you name it. Um, this isn't new in that sense. We're doing it generically with this, and again with the flexibility of the FPGA pins and also having the analog there means that we can actually do um, quite a few functions. I mean, let me know your thoughts. But that is the way I'm leaning right now, is that for the final boards, for the uh, final black ice and its keyboards, I don't have the P mods on the black ice mezzanine. I have these microblades or whatever you want to call them. Four of them. Not only that, but I re actually remove the um, Wi-Fi soldering on, so you don't have to choose it solder time, you can add it later, just into one of these sockets. I mean, one of the first ones I'll do is a C3 blade, C3 micro blade. There's also some other advantages, but I'll, I'll cover those later when we get nearer. This is the weirdest candy. 
When I was in the shop today, I saw this pack of Kit Kats and I thought, well, that's a good price. I'll buy these. I didn't look carefully enough. These aren't normal chunky Kit Kats. These are chunky Kit Kats that are shorter and they have popcorn in. I am not entirely convinced that having popcorn in my Kit Kat is a good idea. It's very, very strange. I bet my uh, eldest would like it. She loves popcorn. Why have you chosen those connectors rather than something like Adafruit Stemma QT? Because the Stemma QTs don't have enough pins on them and they only really do um, I squared C and GPIO. But one of the micro blades I was planning would have one or two stemmer connectors on it so there's a stemmer connector version of this to answer your question it's because these are more flexible than stemmer because these can have stemmer um, Stemma cards. I'm just going to mute for a sec so I get some more water. Hold on. Have a little think about it. Um, there would be four, four of these card connectors, card blades or whatever. Um, Looking for something. Where did I put that?
Um, the other thing you can do is you could have like a, a spy LED connector, like one of the smaller flex connectors, FPC one. There's all sorts you can do on them. It's just enough for all sorts of small things. I don't remember how many um, yeah the stemma connectors only have four pins two of which are power so it's only got two signals which is a bit limited but I can do a little adapter board you know a, a blade a card blade that has two stemma connectors on it um, in fact, you could put you could put three, but I think physically you might have a problem finding the room for three, unless you had them point them in different directions. If you had the vertical ones, you could put three, or you could have a combination: two vertical, one right angle for example so yeah you can connect small uh, OLEDs to them um, if you just need a small OLED uh, you can put these on there those would work along with a buffer if you wanted to um, there's all sorts. You could do a PS2 connector on there. One of these. You could even do a game connector, but it would have to be long enough to fit those big chunky um, connectors on. What you'd probably be better off doing is having a, you know, a, a USB for that. What do you think, Maury? You can have a logic analyzer one as well. Should be kind of cool. Nice and easy to plug in. You could even have like Glasgow ones. How cool would that be? That little Edinburgh's. I just think we'd be wasting it if we just went the PMOD route because we can also already service the PMOD route. We're just duplicating when we could be doing something more um, more useful, I think. It is higher risk, obviously. But I think it's great for these small you know, lower voltage things. Lower current, lower voltage, not the power stuff that you have with tiles. And great for the small things like, you know, sensors and stuff. And Wi-Fi and all those other things that you might want to connect. Or a stemmer adapter, even. Um, I'm sure you can think of a whole bunch, Laurie, of things that you put on one of those little boards. And they're very easy to design once you've designed them once you can. The good thing is they're quite small as well, so you can make them really low cost in terms of um, cost of goods.
you can make one for the um, WS LEDs and you also got the analog one analog signal there as well which you could use quite creatively I guess put temperature sensors and all sorts Anyhow, that's my current thinking. Um, I'm sure we can continue this conversation um, over the next few streams. Um, I'm probably going to stream again on Wednesday, with any luck. Um, not sure what I'm going to cover on Wednesday. I do need to work on this. Um, soft SPI QSPI hybrid um, I don't know if I'll have that operational um, I could work on one of the other tiles maybe lots of possibilities I now know that at least the um, tile functionality is working What else do I have to test on the mezzanine board? Um, I've got to test the LCD connector, but I'm not going to test that yet because I don't have the LCDs, unfortunately. Um, we do need to get the hyper and hyper flash stuff done. Um, so what I want to do is uh, get a board off to um, Sylvan. Have a look at that. That's probably the next step to get those working. Um, where else is on the mezzanine? I'm trying to remember. I know the USB works. Uh, I, I still got to do. Um, I need to do at least some basic um, power delivery testing. I haven't done any of that yet on this new board for the second USB. One of the other things that I want to do for the final versions, currently the power delivery is on the Black Ice NXT mezzanine board and I want to take that off and put that down on the Ice Logic bus because that's really where it should be. It's in the wrong place because um, I'd like that to be able to work independently of the mezzanine so it'd be a common feature to the uh, Ice Logic bus not to the mezzanine it also gives me a bit more room on the mezzanine particularly given that I'm shrinking it down slightly um, so that should, that's a trivial move really because there's plenty of room to put that on the um, Ice Logic board bus sorry IRB. Uh, but I do need to do some basic testing um, to talk to that, make sure that works. Uh, but that's the same whether it's on the mezzanine or or, or on the um, on the uh, ILB. Yeah, as I said, the ESP32 is coming off. I don't want an ESP32 soldered on there. I want that to be on a blade card or whatever we decide to call this thing. Um, there's a couple of good reasons for doing that. One is we can change which Wi-Fi we use. So we're not tied directly to it. Secondly is you don't have to decide when you buy it which we do with the current mini configuration because it has to be soldered on the board. You can't do that easily yourself. You have to reflow it on the board. By having it as one of these, you know, uh, card blades, then you can just slot it in as a user option. 
and we could have more than one option as well. So, you know, if someone wanted, say, an S2 rather than an S3 or something, then that might be possible. Uh, so does that mean moving one of the USB-C connectors to the ILB? Yes, the power delivery connector. And that's all it will be, is power delivery. There won't be any data on that. It's just purely power delivery. No data. It's purely for power. It's a, it's a USB power connector that does up to 20 volts, basically. That's the idea. It's negotiated up to 20 volts. It's not data. That stays on the mezzanine, the data USB, the one that we're using right now. So I, I do need to test that, obviously, um, whether I move it or whatever. I just need to test the basic functionality, which basically is just a conversation, really, having a conversation with the power delivery chip from the STM32. It's basically I2C, which goes down to the mezzanine to the ILB anyhow. So. You know, doesn't matter whether it's on the mezzanine or on the ILB, the conversation is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, folks? Otherwise, I'm going to. Call it for the evening. I mean, we can continue these conversations down on uh, on Discord, of course. Um, oh. So there's quite a few changes for the next set of boards. Yes, but it's all proven stuff. You know, the card blades, blade cards, whatever we call them. Uh, I already know that the footprints in those work because I'm already using one for the SD card. Oh, that's the other thing that we've got to write a test for is the SD, the MMC driver, which we haven't done yet. Although that can happen at our leisure, that's not an important thing in my opinion. But that will be useful. Um, don't forget the other advantage, <laughs> obvious, but by having um, four of these extra um, uh, SD blades, any one of those can be used as a um, SD card socket for the FPGA. So the FPGA gets that automatically. Um, and in terms of ge geometry, there are three on one side where the PMODs are now, and one on the other side where the old power delivery USB was. So yeah, there are a few changes, but it's all proven stuff that we know is working in terms of footprints, and in terms of connectivity up through the mezzanine, etc., it's all tested before we do that. So, um, I think I'll be willing to to make production quality the first production quantities, which is relatively small amount anyhow. Um, 
could you have a double blade yes I mean because I've got three in a row on one side you could use three concurrently if you made a board with three uh, blade ends on it there's nothing stopping you doing that if you so wished doubles singles doubles or triples I mean, it'd be a bit of, bit of fun getting the dimensions right to start with. Once you did that, then yeah. And you'd have, effectively, if you did the triple, you would have three times six uh, FPGI IOs. So you'd have 18 IOs. And you'd have three mixed signal pins from the STM32 in this case. If you so wished, or if you did a double, you'd have 12 um, FPGA IOs and two mix signals. So, I mean, that would be good if you wanted to say do a camera, an FPC camera connector, that'd be perfect. Um, yeah, but yeah, the triple one you go, you could literally go up to eighteen plus three mix signals. So you'd, you've actually got twenty-one IOs, which is fairly impressive. I don't know if you can think of anything that uses twenty-one IOs. Not enough for memory. Um, You know, you couldn't do SRAM or anything like that. You could, could you do PSRAM? No, there's not enough of PSRAM here. Um, I don't know. But there are lots of possibilities by combining them. I think they're going to be cool. I think they're cool. Um, I think others might find them cool as well. Uh, they may just turn out to be rather convenient, I think. I wanted to do them for ages. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you can tell what my vote is. <laughs> Not of this at all. Let's hope everyone else likes it. I just think it's better than regurgitating P mods, particularly when we've already got tile to P mods. Anyhow, it just seems like a waste when we could do something much more interesting and potentially more useful. Right. No more questions then, I will call it a day. Well, thank you for joining me on this. We've come a long way already with this. Um, as I said, there's a few more things that we can test, plus we can test some of the other tiles, potentially. Um, uh, I don't know what we're going to do on Wednesday yet. There's a few things to choose from there. Let me see how we get on. Um, I don't know whether I will have um, sorted this soft, you know, bit banged SPI, QSPI thing by then or not. Be nice to test that. That's that's on the list as needs to be tested. So, yeah. Uh, what doesn't really need to be tested is the tile connections themselves, because I know that those are all working. Apart from number two, which is dodgy, but that's just the connector. It's not not the uh, circuit board. I don't need to change anything on the circuit board for that. Right. Well, thank you, and um, ciao for now. Um, I'll probably probably uh, stream again on Wednesday, but I'll be down on Discord in the interim. Thanks, folks. <laughs>